website right here at World Outreach Church, Wednesday Night Live. Um, we're uh, in the house here. We got about four guys uh, moving around in here, and we're live. Uh, those of you that uh, this is your home church, glad to have you with us. Anywhere else in the city, welcome. Anywhere uh, nationwide, worldwide, those of you that may be tuning in uh, tomorrow because of time changes, uh, glad to have you with us. Um, we, uh, our regular Wednesday night service, uh, we've been on a, <coughs> we've been on a, uh, a subject for, off and on for a number of weeks. Uh, I got stirred, um, oh, years ago, I got stirred about um, going back through, somebody made the statement, uh, and I'll repeat this again. Somebody made the statement, um, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, and so that being the case, um, if we go back and find what he did, um, we'll know what he'll do today. Um, you know, people say, well, you know, got such and such a disease. Well, you know, I've heard that and gone back through, and sometimes I'll find what somebody's dealing with. I like to go back and find where somebody else got healed of that. Uh, somebody else, I, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, then if I can find what he did yesterday, then I'll absolutely know what he'll do today, okay? If he's ever healed somebody of uh, dementia, if he's ever healed somebody of cancer, if he's ever healed somebody of arthritis, if he's ever healed somebody of, of uh, tuberculosis, if he's ever healed anybody of leprosy, if he's ever done that anywhere, then we have scripture to base it on that he'll do it again today. Hebrews 13 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if we can go back and find what he did, and what we'll know what he'll do today. We can put great confidence, okay? I mean, we were in, uh, years ago, I think I think it was probably a meeting we had maybe uh, maybe around 85 to, 90, to uh, 1987. We were at, at a meeting in uh, Paris, France. Uh, Salvaraj Rajia was the pastor there. Um, it was a church, I think it was called La Parole de Foi, uh, in good church, great church. We had n numerous meetings there. And uh, um, we were in there for an extended meeting, I think. Well, extended, I think it was probably maybe five nights, something like that, three to five. And, uh, um, we, and of course, in, in those days, uh, normally what we did was we would uh, uh, have maybe morning teaching sessions, and at night we'd do... Uh, healing services and um, so we finished up the service one night and um, uh, had folks come up for a, a healing line anybody that wanted to be ministered to for healing I believe in the laying on of hands I think the church world has lost a lot of um, a lot of what we could have should have and would have uh, if we dive back into um, the basic doctrine of laying on of hands. I think we've missed some things along the way there in recent years. Gonna, and we'll, we'll get back to it. But uh, we had, I, I don't know, probably maybe 30 to 40 people lined up across the front of the church. We're in an old, old, uh, beautiful old, uh, I think it was a Lutheran church. Uh, not real sure, but anyway, Lutheran or Catholic church that they'd rented to, to meet in. And, uh, uh, you know, we're starting to... to um, uh, minister to people and here was a we come up and here's a here's a uh, a real nice looking uh, younger woman and then there's a guy that she's with that is a rack of bones he he looks like he's just death warmed over okay we look almost looks like he'd have to get better to die and so uh, we got to him and I looked up at her and I I said something and she answered me so I knew that she, she would speak English because my French is non-existent, okay? So anyway, I, I said something and she said, um, he's got AIDS. Now this is in the uh, mid-80s. Um, this is before AIDS was as, it was before we, we know as much about it as we do now, okay? Um, and as far as how it's transmitted, how people get it, how, uh, anything about it. And um, never heard of anybody getting healed of it at that particular time. Um, so she said, he's got AIDS. And I said, oh, really? And of course, my first thought is, I think I'm going to back up. But, you know, Jesus never was concerned about getting what people had. He was more concerned about people getting what he had. You know, I mean, it was, in his day, leprosy was so contagious, but he didn't just, you know, in one chapter, he, he, the 10 lepers came and he, they cried from afar off and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And, and from afar off, he said, go show yourself to the priest. But another one, came and fell down before him 
And he said, if you will, you can, make me hand, uh, you can make me clean. Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him, touched the leper. So he was not afraid of getting what people had. He wasn't concerned about things being contagious. Apparently, wasn't concerned about COVID or wasn't concerned about uh, leprosy. It wasn't, okay, so. Um, but we didn't know anything. My first thought was, ah, is this supposed to be contagious? I don't know anything about this. And uh, the lady said, she said, uh, we fly for such and such an airline. I'm a flight attendant, and so is he. But he, um, you know, he uh, leads a homosexual lifestyle, or he has, um, and he contracted AIDS, and he's dying, which was very obvious. And she said, but I shared Jesus with him, and he's gotten born again. He's a new creature in Christ, and he is really, by his own admission, he is delivered from the lifestyle of homosexuality. Okay, and um, so she said, but just you can see now he needs healing. Well, you know, just boy, that just a boldness came on, and we laid hands on him and took authority over that AIDS virus and cursed it and commanded it to die and leave his body. He's a new creature in Christ. Okay, so service is over. I don't know, I'm thinking maybe two nights later, um, the lady came back, the flight attendant came back, and we saw her and asked her, said, how is your friend doing? She said, she said he, almost immediately his color came back, his coloring came back. He started putting weight on, all the discomfort left. She said he, he got healed by the power of God, I think it was two nights ago. Said that AIDS stuff is dead, he's doing great. Well, see, the thing is, I'm convinced of that. I, I, you know, I, I know now, later down the road, I know folks that have, you know, gotten healed of full-blown AIDS. I know of, of people like that, okay? So the thing is, back to Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. If I can find somebody that's gotten healed of something, then I can boldly pray for somebody um, with the same thing. I, I've, I found a note in my Bible, an old Bible. I had a note from a, uh, uh, a young man's name is Noah, young man um, that had numerous diseases. I mean, uh, had I uh, can't even tell you the names of them right now, but numerous disease, born with them, um, uh, in all incurable. Never gonna, he's never gonna live right, never gonna think right, never gonna walk and talk right. We're in a church, and the Holy Ghost started moving, and we called some things out by the Spirit of God. And a lady came up, and she said, "That's my son. He's up in children's church." And uh, all I know is we got a letter a couple of years down the road from her, and information on him. He graduated from high school, he was in college, perfectly normal. Well, so I can take those diseases that he had attack his body, actually born with, and I can pray with a great faith for that. Now, just on one verse, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he ever did it before, he'll do it today. If we can find anything he's done before, um, and if we haven't, let's go ahead and minister to people now and Folks are going to get healed, delivered, set free, and down the road from now on, we're going to have living proof that he is that he will heal uh, of that. You know, I, um, so anyway, um, uh, we're staying on the subject of the healing miracles of Jesus' ministry. As I said, somebody said years ago, um, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Find anything he ever did, and you'll have a confidence he'll do it again. He'll never change. But they also said, do yourself a favor and find not only what he did and know that he'll do it again, but find what people did that got results. If you do what they did, you'll get what they got. Okay, I know I've heard people for years, they, you start teaching on healing and people say they want to give you a list of people that didn't get healed. Well, I don't want to follow uh, failures, I want to follow successes. Okay, I don't want to call it a failure when people don't get healed. But I don't want to follow after where it doesn't look like it worked because I don't know what happened there. The uh, Bible said there is the curse causal shall not come. You see over in Paul writing to the Corinthians, he says, for this cause, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep, many die early. There's, there's always going to be a cause of some sort. Another subject, we may spend a month on that sometime. There's some things we really need to know need to be ministered in the local church. Now, um, now, um, so I, I, I went back through, this was many years ago now, and I went from uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, just, the healing miracle, just the healing miracles, not the ones where he multiplied the loaves and the fishes, uh, not the ones where he raised the dead, not the ones where, uh, you know, 
where, where Jesus told Peter to go fishing, pulled the coin out of its mouth and paid their taxes. Those are miracles. But I wanted to go through and just find the healing miracles of Jesus' ministry. So uh, we did that. I, I, spent, I spent probably a few years and, and taught, did a whole series on the healing miracles of, of Jesus' ministry. Well, I got kind of stirred to go back through. I haven't done this in years now. But I wanted to go back through and the, the leper in Mark 1, the, 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 para, the, ma, the paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2, and, and uh, the, 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 the nobleman's son, the woman with the issue of blood. And we've gone through most of them, and we, we may kind of bring it to a halt before long and move on. But uh, uh, if, you, uh, uh, if you go back through... Um, uh, somebody said, actually, I'll, actually, um, oh goodness, years ago now, we were talking with uh, Dr. T. L. Osborne. He's been over in heaven for a number of years now, but God used him. He was a he was a uh, uh, an apostle slash evangelist. He was an evangelist that sent was sent a uh, sent one to the nations of the world with the gospel frontier evangelism. So he really stood in the office of apostle slash evangelist. That's what he and and. Uh, his you find fruit you still find fruit of his ministry all over the world okay but um uh just knew so much knew so much about redemption so much about um mass healings and frontier evangelism well we're talking with him one time and he said you know he said uh, uh he said it's really interesting he said if i can get places first if i can get places first he said i preach jesus the double cure savior of our sins and healer of our sickness he says if i can get there first i'll preach jesus the double cure and he said i'll i do that and he said people will get saved and healed all over the field all over all over where we're, we're doing the meetings and he said uh, uh so if i can get there first but he said but he said but if some other groups get there ahead of me he said my work's cut out for me i can preach jesus the double cure he said, I can get people saved, but he said, but, but I have to, if, if they got there ahead of me, the, I have to plow through Job's boils and Paul's thorn before I can get people healed. Because there are people, whole organizations, they know more about Job's boils than they do Jesus' stripes. They know more about Paul's thorn than they do the stripes Jesus bore for us. And he said, if they get there ahead of me, they get people so indoctrinated with Paul's thorn and Jesus, uh, in, Paul's thorn and in and uh, Job's boils, that uh, I've got to plow my way through that. I can get them saved, but i got to plow through that and get that unbelief out of them before I can get them healed. Well, I thought that's a pretty strong statement. If I can get there first, we'll have great results. If others get there ahead of me, I'm liable to have to plow through this. Well, I thought, well, that's you know, a pretty strong statement. Well, it wasn't long after that that we did a, uh, 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 I, I took a trip, actually, to uh, 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 southern part of India went went with a, a group six of us went six of us men went and we were there for a month did a a, a four-week ministers conference in the southern part of, of India and uh, <clears throat> and each one of us took a subject every day we'd we'd uh, do an hour teaching and then a, a half hour of questions and answers uh, and so we do that every day okay so end up with an eight-hour day every day so for for four weeks well, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> excuse me, somebody else got, you know, the, I, was the, I was the youngest guy in the group, so I, you know, so I was at the, the bottom of the pecking order. And so somebody took uh, the authority of the believer. Somebody took faith. Somebody took prayer. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, they went through all the subjects, and there's one subject left, the subject of healing, and they said, there, you got that. Well, what they didn't know was I was thrilled to get that. I've been studying and ministering on healing already for a few years, so I was glad to get the subject, but I thought, okay, I'm going to teach this for, for I'm going to teach this uh, an hour a day for four weeks. I didn't know if there was that much in the Bible on healing. Honestly, we got done with four weeks, and we're just getting started. We could have gone another four weeks. The Bible's filled cover to cover on the subject of divine healing, okay? So anyway, um, so we started out in the first day, um, uh, I went out there and I, I began, uh, you know, I said, now, um, you know, there's no use teaching healing uh, until you teach where sickness comes from. If sickness is from God, no use trying to get rid of it. If sickness is from God, James says it's good. 
Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If sickness is from God, then it's good. Instead of trying to get rid of it, my goodness, let's pray and ask God for a double portion and go pass it out to our neighbors. If sickness is from God, it's good. Let's go burn down hospitals and take doctors and nurses and run them out of town on a rail, tar and feather them. If sickness is from God, it's a good thing. Let's never pray to get better. Let's never take medicine. Let's never go to a doctor. Let's never have surgery. Let's never go to a hospital. If sickness is from God, it's a good, well, see, now I figured on their sign they called themselves full gospel. I found out later they were half gospel, and the half I was preaching was the half they didn't believe. So I was, I didn't mean to be going in there like a bull in a china shop. I wasn't trying to stir up trouble. I just thought we all believe the same because that's what their sign said. And so uh, I got real bold about that. And uh, <clears throat> that's another subject I won't take time to go into. Uh, I will say, down the road, four weeks, um, by the time we got to the end of the, the four-week uh, minister's conference, um, we had m most of the ministers in that. We had uh, over 100 ministers. Most of them had been healed by the power of God. By the time we got done, I never prayed for one, never laid hands on one, I didn't do anything. I just kept giving them the word, getting them convinced that sickness is a bad thing from the devil and healing is a good thing from God. And it's always, always God's will to heal you. Spent four weeks teaching that. that the power of the word got lodged into those ministers. And by the end of four weeks, power of God was hitting that place and people were getting healed all over the building on a regular basis. Uh, like I said, I didn't have anything to do with it other than teaching the Bible. And if it worked then, it'll work today. So anyway, I, uh, um, I finished this up, and to finish my story there, um, now this is, this is an, an Indian dialect, which, I mean, sometimes in, in French or German or Spanish or Italian, sometimes you can hear a few words that are similar, and you might get a gist of where a conversation is going, maybe a little bit, not necessarily, but maybe a little. With the Indian dialects, nothing makes any sense. I didn't understand a syllable out of any of that. But one man raised his hand up because we finished up the first hour and, and now it's time for questions and answers. And one man raised his hand and said something in the Indian dialect. And my interpreter, <clears throat> he says, uh, he wants to know what about Job's boils. And, uh, and another fellow yelled something out. And I said, well, I know what he said. He said, you understand that language? I said, no, but I know what he said. He said, what did he say? He said, what about Paul's thorn? He said, that's exactly right. How would you know that? Long story. But I knew we had to go back through and to, to, to put it in a, in a nutshell. Um, what Brother Osborne said proved out to be true, and we've watched it in nations all over the world. If we can get to places before they've heard anything else, we can preach Jesus, and it's so easy to get people healed. If others get there ahead of us, we've got to plow through this other stuff. There are... There are um, to quote the, uh, a term somebody used years ago, we've got sacred cows in the body of Christ. We've got, we've got certain doctrines that have been planted into the church world, and until we get past those, we're not, there's a lot of folks that are not going to get healed. One question can keep you sick. One answer can get you healed. Okay, we've got that from Mark chapter 1, the leper. If you will, you can make me clean. Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately the leprosy was departed and he was cleansed. Okay? didn't work until he got his question answered it didn't work until he got his question answered okay um so um there are some 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 situations through primarily through the ministry of jesus and, and then of course we, we see it on through into paul's ministry into the book of acts and uh, there there are some questions the religion has stirred up and dropped in our laps and it's left questions in the body of Christ and because of that a lot of folks aren't getting healed because they got this mind block going in there well you know I don't know how uh, I don't know how many weeks we're going to go through this um, I kind of laid out a foundation for it now but I want to go to uh, <coughs> excuse, <coughs> excuse me, I want to go to uh, John chapter 9 and I want to start out with one of these uh, there's there, the, 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 the particular ones are Job's boils, Paul's thorn, Timothy's uh, stomach, Trophimus who was left sick at Miletum, Lazarus in John 11, and the blind man in John 9. Okay, so there's, there's basically six things, six um, uh, instances that have really been um, misinterpreted in the 
uh, in the Christian world, and uh, um, truth will make you free, but Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Didn't say my people are destroyed for lack of faith. Didn't say my people are destroyed because, you know, because God didn't want to help them. No. He says, Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Isaiah 5, 13 says, for, uh, for this reason, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. <laughs> you see, we really don't have a, primarily we don't have a faith problem. We primarily have a knowledge problem. Once you get knowledge of the scriptures, once you get knowledge of truth, faith just rides in with, with it. And truth, he says, if you continue in my word, Jesus said, if you'll continue in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed, and you'll know the truth. If you continue in my word, you'll be my disciples indeed, and then you'll know the truth, and the truth is going to make you free. It doesn't just set you free, it makes you free. But it starts out knowing, knowing truth. And so uh, we know from the scriptures. Um, I, I think we see things sometimes that have been... Uh, uh, People, people say, well, it looks like God's a bad God, does bad things. No, God's a good God, God's, God does good things. But a lot of times folks have, have run into situations like this, and that's why um, we know in, in the Scriptures that we're told, uh, Paul wrote, and he said, uh, um, um, told us to, to uh, study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, he wouldn't have to tell us to rightly divide it if it hadn't, if it's not possible to have it wrongly divided. So what we want to do is we want to go back through and look at some of these things. I want to start here in uh, John chapter 9, verse 1. Um, it says, um, <clears throat> and as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Okay, didn't say God sent him to this man. It said as he passed by, he saw this guy. Okay, um, a friend of ours did a message years ago on life's little interruptions. Uh, many of the miracles in Jesus' ministry were, uh, were not where God sent him to set somebody free, although there were some there. <clears throat> many of the miracles in Jesus' ministry were where he, he had what was called a life's little interruption. Okay, uh, Mark 5. Um, Jairus, ruler of the synagogue, came to Jesus. My, my child's at home point, at the point of death. Jesus went with him. They're on their way to his house, going to raise up his little girl, raise her up. He said, if you come lay your hands on her, she'll live, she'll be healed. Jesus went with him. As they're going along, this woman that had an issue of blood came in the press behind and touched his garment, for she said, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be whole. Straightway, the fountain of her blood was dried up. She felt in her body she was healed of that plague, and we know the rest of the story. So it isn't interesting. He's on a mission to get this little girl healed, eventually raised from the dead. And along the way, somebody sneaks up behind him, takes hold of the hem of his garment, pulls healing virtue out of him, and he stops in his tracks, listens to her testimony, commends her, and the people all listening. Meanwhile, the little girl that he's going to raise up dies, so now he's going to go raise her from the dead. Interruptions. Many of the miracles in Jesus' ministry weren't necessarily... Um, divine direction as much as a divine interruption so it says here as jesus passed by he's passing by he saw a man which was blind from birth okay now following the, this you know there's different kinds of healings there's people that about 78 percent of the time people came to jesus and said you know got healed and jesus said or inferred their faith made them whole mark 5 20, 25 daughter your faith made you whole Others, according to your faith, so be it done unto you. Believe, do you believe I can do this? Yea, Lord, according to your faith, so be it done unto you. Many cases in the Gospels, Jesus attributes the healing, the miracle to their faith. But then we've got these other ones where it's, it's not even really their faith in operation. Um, it's, it's, it's not them pulling it out of him. It's him delivering it to them in, in just, just out of the mercy of God. He's passing by, he sees a man that's blind from birth, okay? Now, there's no way of knowing, but from what I've heard, legend tells us that the reason the man's blind was he was born without eyeballs. He's born without eyes, okay? We don't know, no way to prove it, yay or nay, but legend said this man is born without eyes, so he's blind, which would explain some things a couple verses later. Verse uh, 2 and is, now here's where we want to get, we want to kind of correct some things that have held, held people bondage, 
Okay? Now, Jesus' disciples asked him, saying, Master, now, now follow along here, <laughs> said, Master, who did sin? Who did sin? Master, who did sin? Isn't that interesting? Somebody's blind, born blind, and the disciples, they're still stuck in their, their traditions, their religious doctrines. And they said, Master, who did sin? This Now follow this, this man or his parents that he's born blind. Okay, now, if you go to verse 34, this was, a, this was something that the, the religious leadership taught people. When the guy gets healed, verse 34, they answered and said unto him, to the man when he gets healed, uh, you are altogether born in sins and you teach us. You see, they got this doctrinal thing that if somebody's born with sickness, if somebody's born with disease, um, that, uh, that if they're born that way, their tradition says one of two things happen. Okay, either, okay, Either the parents sinned while the child was in the womb or the child sinned while the child was in the womb, okay? So they're going to blame somebody. If somebody's born sick, then they're either the, it's either the parents or the child. And this, this was so rampant that even Jesus' disciples haven't got this figured out yet. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who sinned? This man or his parents said he's born blind. As far as they're concerned, one of them did it, okay? Um, now, we go on the next verse, and now verse 3. Now Jesus answered, they asked the question, you know, truth makes you free. Jesus answered, neither hath this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it's still day. The night comes when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Okay, so now he, what did he do? He answered the question. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Neither hath this man, he answered uh, 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 he answered a uh, 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 crazy question with a stable answer. Master, who did sin? This, uh, this man or his parents said he's born blind. Jesus answered and said, neither of this man sin nor his parents, period. Um, goodness. Um, uh, let's, look at, let's look at something here, all right? Um, I have, <laughs> if you look at uh, King James, other Paraphrased editions might say other things, but looking at the King James, King James or New King James, the ones we're more familiar with, it says here, verse 3, now in most, many translations, it says, Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, and then there's a, a colon there. In other words, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, period. Okay, but now, now he's going to make this statement that's goofed people up in the way we've read it. Uh, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. All right, you know, let's look at it again. Let's look at what he said here. Jesus answered, verse 3, Jesus answered, neither hath this man sin nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. It looks like Jesus is saying it wasn't the parent's sin, it wasn't the child's sin in the womb. This child was born this way because God wanted to work his works in him. This is here so the works of God could be made manifest in him. Okay, so we've said for, for years, the, the parents didn't sin, the child didn't sin, that's ridiculous, okay, but the reason the man's born blind was because God's want, God wants to show his power, so he made this guy born blind, isn't that what he said? Jesus answered, neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made, made manifest in him. The reason he's born this way is so God could show his power. Well, that always bothered me. Um, number one, you don't find that anywhere else in the New Testament. You don't, you, mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. You're not going to find any other witnesses of that. You don't, I mean, think about it. Think about it. What religion is saying is that God had this guy born blind so he could show the world how nice he is when he heals him. You know, that'd be like, that'd be like calling somebody up in a service and saying, I'm going to push you down so I can take you by the hand and, and, and pull you up. I can let the whole church see how nice I am because I'm going to knock you down so they'll see how nice I am when I pick you back up. To say God made a man born blind so he could raise him up and show everybody how nice he was does not make any sense. Okay? Besides that, think about it. We, Jesus healed the two blind men. Jesus healed blind Bartimaeus. Jesus healed many blind people. Did somebody need to help God with this deal? Let him know you don't have to make another man born blind because you already got a world full of blind people. You can just heal one of those. You don't have to start another one. Don't have to create another one. See, this, this is all ridiculous statements. This is, this is so crazy. 
So let's, let's take a look at something here. This always bothered me. I just couldn't understand that. It just, I, heard, I heard it taught. I read it in books. I've, I've seen it in, in paraphrased translations. But I never could understand. I, I didn't get what he's saying there. Uh, you know, what, what, what's wrong with this? It's, it's not making anybody free, so it can't be truth. Truth makes people free. If it keeps them bound, it can't be truth. So <clears throat> I heard somebody say this years ago, and I wanted to search it out. I heard somebody say um, in, tra in reading through the Scriptures, <clears throat> particularly the New Testament, um, the, when the Bible was written in its original Greek, okay, when the Bible was written, um, in the original language, there were no punctuations. And so the translators added punctuations in to make it say what they thought it was supposed to say. All right? Now, I didn't know if that was true or not, so a number of years ago we were, in, uh, we were doing meetings in Athens, Greece. We went out to another village outside there. We were staying in the pastor's home, uh, doing meetings in, in the nation of Greece, <clears throat> and had an interpreter there. And finally I said, okay, i gotta, I got to do it. i got to ask you this, okay? Um, I... I, uh, I've got a question. I said, I've heard, I've heard the original language in Greek was written with the original language with no punctuation, no, no capital letters, no periods, no question marks, no colons, no semicolons, no commas, none of that. that it was, so the translators added those in. Is that correct? <laughs> the guy said, well, it's a little hard to tell because honestly, sometimes we claim that we know the, the Greek language, but he said the Greek language has changed 13 times since the Bible was written in Greek. So he said, there's a lot we claim to know, but we really don't know um, because of all the changes in the Greek. And I said, oh, okay. But he went back in the back, came out with a piece of Xerox copy, a piece of paper. And he said, here is a copy of a copy of a copy of an original transcript of what the Bible, New Testament, looked like in Greek. I looked at it and with no knowledge of Greek, there were no periods, there were no commas, there were no capital letters, no, no uppercase, no lowercase. It was just all Greek, okay? So he said, yes, to answer your question, when this was translated, the, the translators had to, had to take some uh, liberty in how to, how to translate this. Um, and a lot of times their particular beliefs would come through just by punctuation. So look at this, all right? Trust you got a Bible in front of you. Uh, John chapter 9, verse um, 3. Now it says here, Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. It looks like Jesus is saying, The reason this guy was born blind was because God wanted to be able to show uh, his wonderful power. But let's change a couple um, punctuations, all right? Verse 3 Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, period. So there's a colon there. Take that out. Neither of this man, he's, what's he doing? He's answering their question. Okay, the parents didn't sin. The boy, the, the man didn't sin in the womb. The parents didn't sin. He's got a, quite, a stupid question, so he gives them a straight answer. Well, they said, who, who sinned? Does this man or his parents that he's born blind? Neither of this man sinned nor his parents. That's not the question. That's not the issue. That's not what happened. Now, capital letter, but, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, comma, I must work the, work the works of him that sent me while it's still day. The night comes when no man can work. Now think about that. You change a colon and a comma, put a period in there, simply punctuation, and it changes the entire meaning, and it takes it back into the very nature of God, okay? You don't, you don't, you don't see God making people sick to make them well. You don't see God making people born sick so he can, he can be nice and make them well. That doesn't make any sense. So if you take this, change a couple punctuations. So therefore, let's read it this way, okay? Jesus answered, neither at this man sin nor his parents, period. Answer the question. Now, but that the works of God should be made manifest. In other words, this isn't the work of God. This is not the work of God. The, this, this sickness, this blindness is not the work of God, okay? but that the works of God should be made manifest in him, I must work the works of him that sent me. Jesus is saying, these are not the works of God, but now I am going to work the works of God. The night comes when no man can work. What's he saying? God didn't do this, okay, but I'm going to fix it. These are not the works of God. Never says it's the work of God, but I am going to, now I'm here, and I'm going to work the works of God that, uh, while it's still day, because the night comes when no man can work. So, 
so now he's going to heal the guy. The blindness was not the work of God. You don't find that in the scriptures. The sickness, disease, uh, uh, problems at birth, birth defects, things like that. That's not the work of God. God didn't do that. He didn't permit it. He didn't cause it. He didn't commission it. He didn't allow it. You, well, yeah, but what about that sin issue? It wasn't the man's sin. It wasn't the parent's sin. It was Adam's sin that came into the world. It wasn't an individual sin that caused that man to be born blind. It's sin that came into the world through the fall of humanity. Because of that, that's why these things happen. But in the middle of that, Jesus just jumps in there and says, I'm going to work the works of him that sent me. These aren't God's works, but I'll work, God. I'll work God's works. The night comes when no man can work. So here's what we're looking for. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Now, verse 6. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, anointed the man's eyes, uh, anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed and came seeing. Okay, well, here's a healing in the ministry of Jesus. Um, later on, the, the religious leader saw him and said, you know, what are you doing? This was on the Sabbath day. Guys, these guys healed. They're upset about it. And they said, you know, what are you doing? And who is this guy? The guy said, somebody just healed me. Who was it? In verse uh, uh, 17, he said, he's a prophet. He didn't know who Jesus was. A man named Jesus healed me. He doesn't know anything. All he knows is he's been born blind. But now, look at this. Jesus walks up. He doesn't lay hands on him. He did sometimes. He didn't say, be healed in the name of Jesus. What did he do? He did a creative miracle. He takes dirt, spits on it, turns it into mud, and anoints the man's eyes. As I said, we'll get back to it. We don't know for sure, but there's probably a common belief that the reason he made mud was because we're made from the dust of the earth. The reason he did that was um, to be able to put mud in this man's eye sockets, and God did a creative miracle. When he went and washed in the pool of Siloam, he came again seeing. See this, and I'm going to quit with this. We could go for another hour. But what we see in here is, is that um, there, are he there are healings that are instant. Um, the woman with the issue of blood, Mark 5, immediately, immediately she felt in her body she's healed of that plague. Immediately. Everything's all better. Well, that's great. Then you go over Luke's gospel, <clears throat> and you've got the ten lepers that come to Jesus, cried from afar off, said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. He said, go show yourself to the priest. And the Bible said, as they went, they were healed. Some healings are instant. Love those. Some healings are as people go. Love those. We've seen, we've seen people for 40-some years now minister to people. They got the same symptoms, the same sickness, the same disease, don't feel a bit better. Come back, back to one, two, three days later, um, and... They're perfectly healed. Some are instant. Some are as people go. Um, John, the fourth chapter, the nobleman came, and uh, Jesus said, uh, you know, uh, go your way. You're, you're, you know, your, your, your child's all right. And, and the Bible said uh, he began to amend from that hour. So you got instant, you got as you go, or you begin to amend. But here we, got, we see another deal here. Jesus is operating and working in miracles, but if you'll notice, a lot of things are a process. A lot of things are a, a process. That's where people miss it. If you folks go, go to church, if churches have a minister to the sick, folks go and get he, hands laid on and can't figure out what's going on, what, what's going wrong. I got hands laid on. I've had everybody lay hands on me. I've had people lay hands on me until I got friction burns on my forehead. I've had everybody, every preacher, every healing evangelist, every TV preacher, every radio preacher sent me a, 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 a prayer cloth. Everybody's prayed for me. I've got nothing. Where people miss it is they keep looking for the instant one. They keep looking for the instant miracle, and that's a m minority of the healings in Jesus' ministry. Uh, a lot of healings are a progression, and if you stop before the progression is finished, you forsake your own mercy, okay? What do you mean by that? Look at this. Verse uh, 6, when Jesus had spoken, he spat on the ground. Here starts the process. Spat on the ground. Number two, he made clay of the spittle. Number three, he anointed the man's eyes. Number four, he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam. Okay, he didn't miss it on any of those. He, he took the dirt, sped on the dirt, rubbed it in the man's eyes, said, he did four things right here. Now, 
the healings the healings begun but that man's going to have to do something to get that healing manifested in his body okay he said go wash in the pool of siloam which is by interpretation sent and now the last part of verse 7 says he went his way therefore and washed now think about that what if he'd have said uh you know there's a pool that's closer than the pool of uh siloam i'm gonna go dip in that one he wouldn't have got his healing what if he just said, well, I'm just going to go home and wash it off. It's, you know, it's a lot closer to, to my home than it is to the to pool of Siloam. What if he wouldn't have gone and washed off? What if he would have gone home and just washed it off? He'd have walked away saying, well, that healing stuff, there's nothing to it. I had mud in my eyes and I washed it off. Nothing happened. The progression is, but, is following the leading of the Holy Ghost. Jesus did his part. That man still got to do his part. What did he do? Go wash in the pool. I, I know cases. I'm going to finish here. Um, um, I know of cases, oh, oh, many cases over the years, where um, people got a healing started, but they had to do something to get it completed. All right? For instance, here's a guy, um, uh, uh, John Lake, John G. Lake, amazing ministry. And uh, uh, he had healing rooms in Spokane, Washington, had over 100,000 documented healings in five years. Amazing healing ministry. Well, um, somebody comes to his healing rooms and Brother Lake's praying for him. And he says, oh, I'll come back again next week or whatever. And the guy keeps coming back. He's praying for him. He's got this amazing healing anointing. Guy keeps coming back. Nothing's happening. Keeps coming back. Nothing's happening. Keeps coming back. Finally, finally, Lake says, I, this is not working something's wrong i want to ask you something every time i pray for you i keep getting i'm going to pull a number out because i don't know what it was i keep getting a number of say five hundred dollars which would have been huge in that day uh, that wasn't the number but every time i pray for you i get the number five hundred dollars there's something about five hundred dollars uh, that i don't know what it is does that make any sense to you he kind of hung his head said yeah i know what that is i know exactly what that is he says what do you mean he said, well, he said, um, my parents were up in years. I have siblings that didn't help with anything. I was the sole caregiver for my parents. So I was, therefore, I was the executor of their estate. And so when I distributed their estate, I figured that I was, my work was worth $500. So I took $500 off the top, and then I split it up amongst all the siblings. And I kept $500 for myself because I figured I'd earned that. Okay. Um, there wasn't what was in the estate. It wasn't in the will. It wasn't the parent's decision. It's what he thought he earned. And Lake said, well, I don't know. You know, just go do whatever's in your heart. Guy says, I know what to do. I'm going to go get that straight. He said the fellow went, took that $500, split it up amongst his siblings, apologized to them for not being upright with them, and said, you know, he never came back to get healed because he got something right. Okay. In his healing, there's a progression, and sometimes, sometimes there's something we need to do. Sometimes there's something we need to settle. Sometimes there's something we need to, you know, here, God, what did, this guy had to just go dip in the pool of Siloam, and he came again seeing, all right? It's a progression of healing. Jesus' healings were not all instant. Here's one that was a whole process. But as long as the guy did the process, he got healed. Naaman had to go dip in the Jordan seven times. What if he'd have stopped at six and said, this is ridiculous. I'm, not, I'm in this muddy lake out here. I'm in this muddy river and it's not working. I've, done, I've gone down six times. What if he'd have quit at six instead of going seven? Something about following uh, instructions. Well, we've gone long enough. We're going to go through some of these. Uh, there's some things about, uh, about uh, Lazarus and some other. There's some things I want to get back through. Truth will always make us free. Hallelujah.